legend. That's an interesting word. Great players make great coaches, period. You could be the best X and O guy in the world, but if you don't have the players, forget about it. And great players need coaches that understand the mission. Chuck Kyle is the man whose story will be told for decades to come. Well, I was the youngest of four boys, okay? And uh, I was born in Hammond, Indiana. And basically that's, oh, not, not far. Uh, maybe under an hour drive from Notre Dame, okay? And I bring that up be because my, uh, my mother's family during the Depression would listen to the radio, uh, the Notre Dame games, right? Now, they didn't have the money to go to the games, okay? But believe it or not, they would hop in the car, or at least this is what my mom told me, they would hop in the car on Sunday and drive to Notre Dame and just walk around. And in uh, 1930, Six, I think it was. My dad was on a state championship football team in Hammond, Indiana. So there's a family uh, interest in the game uh, that goes back generations. I can remember being a very, very little boy, and for me, I had to I had to play up because I had three older brothers, and so there was no uh, whining. If, if I wanted to play, I, I had to take my lumps, you know. If you had a little family room, there's times where it was tackle football in the family room and I you know, you get lit up into a wall several times, but you'd lived with it, right? Um, but I, I look back and appreciate that because uh, I'm, I'm not the biggest person in the world, uh, but I was always used to playing up. I went to Holy Family in Parma and in eighth grade, we won the city championship. A lot of good players were on that team, actually. That some went to Ignatius, a number of them went to Valley Forge. They had a great team that year, and my, our senior year. And a number of guys went on to play in major college, so it just happened to be that way. But uh, certainly we were involved in all the sports, uh, baseball and basketball, and, and, but football was really historically part of our family. Clearly, my, my parents want, wanted Catholic schools. There was just no debate about that. I, I totally, 100% of my life, Catholic education. So when they came to, when we moved to Cleveland, you know, my oldest brother was at that point in grade school where he, in another few years, a couple years, he's, he's going to go to high school. And uh, my parents decided, just talking to other people who have sent, who sent their sons to Ignatius, that that would be a good idea. So by the time I got there, and I would sit down at a class, you know, the teacher would go through the, the roster and they'd go, Kyle, give a look, you know, because, yes, my, I had three older brothers, so yeah, hopefully they didn't leave a bad taste uh, for, the, for this teacher, but uh, it, it just was part of my family uh, as, as, as I was growing up. So I'm, I was at little freshman and put his tie on and I, it was Loyola Hall, I can remember. I walked up and there's this young male teacher, Mr. Pasco, right, who's going to teach us, you know, world history. And uh, his first 45 minutes of St. Ignatius High School as a teacher, ironically, were my first 45 minutes of St. Ignatius as a student. One of the things I do remember about Chuck in class was I saw in the, uh, you know, in the grade book, I entered, you know, Charles Kyle. And then I'm hearing the kids calling, I hear Chico. And I said, Chico, who in the heck's, you know, who's Chico? And then I figured that's the nickname. And then I was concerned. I was, oh, geez, he's got this nickname, Chico. Maybe was that 
does he want that or is that something the kids are making? You know, I didn't know what, you know, kind of what to, you know, what to make of it. That followed him all the way through, you know, his, his school days here, John Carroll and off to when he came here on the, on the staff. But I remember kind of wondering, geez, you know, where, where did that come from? You know, as a kid, you, you pretend you're a certain ball player. Well, there was a shortstop for the Chicago White Sox named Chico Carrasquel. And I, for some reason, I thought that was a fantastic name. Right, I was a little kid. We moved to Cleveland. Guess who gets traded to the Cleveland Indians? Yeah, Chico Carrasquel. So I was like, of course. I was a little kid. I thought that was, well, of course he's moved to Cleveland you now. So my brothers start calling me Chico. Now, we move in, so not many people knew us. And so most of the neighborhood just called me Chico. I went to Nazareth, and he was at Ignatius. I um, went to a mixer at Padua High School. He'll tell you that he saw this girl under a beam of light in the gym. <laughs> that was me. So anyway, he asked me to dance, and after he left, this friend that had gone to grade school with him said, do you know who that was? That's Chico Kyle, and I'm like, Chico, okay. <laughs> and um, he was my first date. He was the guy that, you know, with a car came and picked me up and took me to a movie. I always liked high school football, luckily. <laughs> so yeah, I went to probably every single game of his when he was in high school. I remember he intercepted a pass and ran it in for a touchdown. And he wasn't even a defensive player, but the coach had called him in to play defense. And my friend was next to me and she screamed so hard that she fainted. <laughs> when Chuck was a senior and playing at Ignatius, we played Cathedral Latin in that year. Ignatius was down by almost two touchdowns in that fourth quarter. And Ignatius makes one of the most incredible comebacks, scoring two touchdowns, winning that game 21-20. If you ask Chuck Kyle as a player, which was one of the most exciting games that he was ever in, that one. And what happens 20 years later in 1988 as now as coach, he has that most incredible game that I think most Ignatius fans will say that was one of the all-time great. Anyone that knows Chuck Kyle will quickly tell you how he operates with preparation, passion, and commitment. It wasn't only on the gridiron or the track where that was evident. Chico wanted to make state champions out of his students in the classroom as well. Simply put, Chico has always been a teacher. Chuck came on board in the, you know, let's say the mid to late 70s. And Chuck was not immune to, you know, let's say to the, to the pressures of how do we do the best for our kids in kind of a changing world. You know, how about the internet? How about all the changes that, that have come, you know, since then? Is not everything gonna be teacher-centered, you lecture for, you know, for 40 minutes. And, uh, you know, that's just not gonna be, that's just not gonna work. And so uh, I think Chuck, like with the, you know, with the department, had to uh, see what was, you know, going on uh, educationally in the country, what things were working, what things were not working with kids as kids were changing in terms of, you know, their, their uh, backgrounds. How about reading? You know, how about getting kids to read? I mean, that's always been a challenge. And, and you know, all English teachers, you know, kind of, you know, face that. And so uh, we as a department, Chuck part of it, trying to figure out what do we do to try to make our curriculum uh, modern? How do we, what do we do to make our curriculum uh, work and still say, stay true to the Jesuit ideals that we're you know, working under. And what you're doing is, as a teacher, is you're a cheerleader, and what you are doing is you are taking something with which you are very, very passionate, and you are sharing that with other people. You're taking them on a journey with you. And I think that that's what happens in Chuck Kyle's room. He's taking kids to the times of Chaucer in the medieval period. He's taking them into where Shakespeare was. He's taking them into the lives of the short stories. He's taking them on a journey. And that's the one thing that, that I really got from him right at the very beginning when I met him. Unbounded energy and extreme passion. 
And I learned from that. And, uh, you know, from, from him and Pasco, it was like, <laughs> you can't help but getting some of that yourself. You know, Chuck wanted uh, to get as much as he could out of the, you know, let's say the young men that he coached in terms of developing their talent, uh, making them appreciate the gifts, the talents that they uh, had from God. I think in the classroom it was the same way. It didn't matter if these, if these were more challenged groups that he had or if it was you know, just average classes that he was teaching or very gifted classes that he was teaching, it didn't matter. What he wanted was that each kid would try to develop his potential to the, to the best. What a lot of people don't know about Chuck is how much of the uh, time and energy went after uh, the seasons, particularly let's say in football, in terms of trying to help place kids to colleges that would be perfect uh, for them. Not just for, let's say, the athletic end of it, but for them in terms of how they could grow intellectually, how they could you know, grow in terms of academics. Uh, he was just interested in the whole, the total kid. And uh, I, I think that that's what a lot of people, you know, they think of him on the field and it's kind of his fiery demeanor and all that, but yet all the hard work, all the time that he had to put in outside of uh, you know, his performance you know, on the field to help these young men along. One of the, the key leaders of the school I had a special relationship with him. Um, I, I was blessed to get in class with him in, in Chaucer Shakespeare my senior year. He's, he's doing everything. He's not just your, your sports mentor or, or role model, but also someone who's, who wants to shape your life in the classrooms. So Coach Kyle's always been demanding, and him demanding the best on every play is no different than the best in every day of your life. And I think that's something that like I said, I've, I took with me when I played ball, but I also taken with me in my personal life as a father, as a, as a husband, as a businessman, as a son, as a brother, as a friend. Those are the intangibles that I think people will, might not recognize if you haven't played for him, that he instilled in all of his players was just that commitment to excellence on a daily basis and don't settle for anything less than that. In 1983, Chuck Kyle received the opportunity to lead the Wildcats football program. Fortified by the tradition created by people like Father Sullivan, John Wirtz, and Paul Nemec, Chico embraced the opportunity to bring fresh ideas, new coaches, and a game plan that would take advantage of what St. Ignatius students do best. It wouldn't happen overnight, but the time was coming for Wildcats football to be special. He always was involved with the football team. And so then Chico was the defensive coordinator. So it just was sort of logical progression. It wasn't any big revelation. Um, Annie, was born in uh, June of 1983. So I was a little busy with a newborn <laughs> and, you know, football, yeah, he was just doing the same thing he had always been doing. I mean, they spent tons of time down at school. Back in those days, they had to watch film on film. <laughs> so they had to have a film projector and they would go down to school like almost all day Sunday because they would be watching film together and breaking down the plays and everything. It was just like nonstop. So the job opens up. Chico applied, I applied, Jim Michaels applied from the staff. And there were a couple pretty well-known uh, coaches in the area who also applied. And uh, I remember the conversation we had one day. I said, you know, Chuck, I said, uh, you'll probably get the job. I said, but if I get the job, would you be my defensive coordinator? He said, sure. He said, if I get the job, will you be my offensive coordinator? I said, absolutely. So as time goes by, the interviews go through, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, uh, he comes up to my room one day and he says, uh, hey, Nick, he says, I just got the job. Would you be my offensive coordinator? Get it to high, Nick. Just been a five. Just been a five-man line. Right. May have been a slant. Uh, it started actually at John Carroll. That's where I first met Chico. We were fraternity brothers. And when he first saw me in the hallways, he just came up to me and he said, you're coaching football. 
You know, I'll never forget it. That's what's got to do. That's what we got to do now. That's what we got to make great plays now, okay? We just got to make our plays now. A couple things we got to do. So I really owe everything to Coach Kyle as far as having a career here in, in coaching. It all comes down to, to Chico just coming up to me and telling me, you're coaching football. We left the Senate, uh, his, historically, people could look back, and we were in the West Senate for a long, long time. And as soon as you did that, it, the schedule became very challenging because you're, you're scheduling teams that are uh, really state-known powerhouses. And uh, so in realizing that, uh, on, on every level of, of football, whether it's the technique, uh, the conditioning, the strength training, just on and on, we, we had to step up. Uh, I think we've had, we had a good tradition, there's no doubt about it, but just the idea that, that uh, if, as soon as you go independent, you're gonna have a schedule that's gonna be filled with really football powerhouses. And we, we had to learn that, and we had to learn how to work with that. So that foundation was, realized. It, it just forced us to, to understand that we have to, we have, we have smart kids, okay? We may not be the biggest kids, uh, we may not be the fastest guys, but we have smart kids and we have to take advantage of that. Now how can we do that in our program? And that was something that certainly as I became head coach, that was something I, I, I believed in. I, I thought we could challenge our, our kids to do more than just run off tackle and just pound away. We, we can spread people out, throw the ball, and, and do some things that are a little more, at that time, on the cutting edge of what was happening. A beautiful thing is, you know, you set it up and you, you play a first half of football and you come in at halftime. Well, one of the beauties, and, uh, and you could ask our opponents, they know this, we're gonna make adjustments at halftime and our kids are gonna understand it. And that's one of the uh, really beautiful things, uh, a compliment, uh, to the coaching staff all the time is that the faith that they look in the eye and go, okay, coach, now we see what they're doing. What can we do now? What adjustments can we do? And they have to believe in those adjustments and put it out on the field. And that has been a major, major contribution to success. A number of the state championships, you can look at it, and a number of them. We were behind at halftime, a number of them. We won the second half, and, and that was... That was huge. Kid that ran around that backyard, scoring all those touchdowns, he's gonna live his dream tonight. But it isn't just give it! You gotta live. That's reality out there. That's reality, man. That's reality. People doubted you, fellas. People doubted you. And 20 years from now, damn it, I vote! They're gonna talk about a Sadie Nation's football team that everybody doubted. And but believed in themselves, because greatness is your dream. Greatness. When Chico first took over the program, I don't think we had uh, enough good talent across the board uh, to be competitive, and we were working on that. Even when I first got here, uh, when Coach Gizzy was the coach, uh, we got out of the West Senate, and uh, we were playing a schedule that would be comparable to the ones we're playing now, even though they were still pretty much in Greater Cleveland. I mean, at that time, Joe's was a powerhouse. Ed's was very good. Uh, Padua was very good. They were in the state uh, championship game under Chuck Kreefer, who ended up in the NFL coaching. Those are the kinds of teams uh, we were playing back then, which would be equivalent to playing like Maslin or uh, Akron Holbin and those kinds of teams, or teams from Philadelphia. Those are the kinds of schedule, but we didn't have that kind of talent. We had West Senate talent. Tony Antonelli was the defensive coordinator. We were putting our better kids on defense because if, if you can slow them down, then maybe we can get lucky on offense a little bit. Uh, but when Chico took over, put a little bit more emphasis on the passing game. That was kind of my deal. Uh, Chico ran the running game uh, a little bit. And matter of fact, he even coached offensive line. So it, it, was, a, it was a good blend. It was a good blend. A strong foundation doesn't happen overnight. But the building blocks for the St. Ignatius football program began to take hold. Under the leadership of Chico and the coaching staff, the Wildcats made the preparations, did the hard work, 
and most importantly, learn to believe in each other. It was 1988, and the Wildcats were ready to become legendary. I remember the atmosphere in Cleveland. Um, everybody was excited, and I don't think I really realized why. I just knew that everybody was excited. And growing up watching local news, the fact that it, our team was getting so much coverage, that Ignatius was getting news coverage every weekend. Every weekend, there was just this build, this building excitement over what was happening. And with that championship game, I remember just being excited to be there, hoping that you'd win. You hope that, you know, you come back victorious. And we went down on these huge buses. And as a kid, I mean, we were painting our faces, we got paw print tattoos on our cheeks, and then we did win. We were just totally in a new situation. It's the first time we had done this, first time we had made the playoffs, and here we are finding ourselves winning every game, and then we get into the playoffs, and it's like, we don't know what we're doing. You know, we're just playing it one game at a time, and this is where Chico took over and, and helped us through and everything. It was such a totally new experience to be involved in that. And it's like all of a sudden you doubled up on all the preparation that you normally did because you were in a playoff game. And that ended up carrying over into the regular seasons the following years that all of a sudden you're doing all this extra preparation because you know it's the big game. And then we just made that part of our regular routine. We had a veteran team coming back into that year. So there was a, a, a confidence, not, not arrogance. There was, we hadn't made any playoffs ever before, so you, you can't say arrogance. But there was a confidence that we had the talent uh, to be able to do that and do well. And, set a goal of winning a state championship. Now, we hadn't been in the playoffs before, but I think the kids realized we can play with anybody and, and we just have to be ready at that moment in the game, right? Get over the awe of walking into Ohio State Stadium and walking out out there and you're gonna play a game in this place, right? You know, The kids understood that, that, that Princeton was the returning state champions. Well, they had guys back too. So there was a need to understand these guys are very explosive, uh, very talented. But you made a bigger commitment than they have, Douglas. They don't know, they don't know what kind of commitment you make. They don't know the work you put in. And now it's here. You celebrate yourself today. You celebrate yourself today. This next play is going to be my greatest play. Be state champions. Be state champions. Be state champions. Our secondary had speed. I think that was an important part of how we could defend against Princeton, is because their formations at the time are going to latch on one on one, and hopefully the guys up front are going to handle the running game, and and uh, they did. And then offensively, um, you know, we, we we took the lead with a field goal, but. You got to get across the goal line, and finally we had a breakthrough. You know, they, they, they blitzed, and it was a one-on-one -on -one situation, and Mike Buddy caught the ball, broke the tackle, and there it was. Now we have to just hold it up, and that's what the goal line stand was. Princeton has the ball at the end of the game. We're nursing that 10-7 lead. Princeton has the ball, and they are marching. They are moving down the field. And it looks, the way that they are going, it says they're not, you know, they're not going to be stopped. They get a first and 10 inside, you know, the 10 yard line. They're practically on the, you know, on the goal line itself. And then we have just one stop after another. And then the final stop and state champions. And I'm telling you the, the, the electricity, it was, it was, it was magical. Uh, it was a moment in 1988 where uh, I think the, the entire, you know, like Ignatius community came together, you know, driving down to, to Columbus. 
and being there and seeing this absolutely incredible game. The thing I remember most was just sort of the, uh, the controlled chaos that was right then at the end of the game. Just making that goal line stance, that's what I'll always remember about the game. Just, just the excitement of, of being there. It was very emotional, as you can imagine. It was very dramatic. And I'm not embarrassed to say there were young, hearty men with tears running in their eyes, right? And, and uh, that's okay. It was good. And we came back. The bus pulled up to Ignatius. I remember there was no formula for this. And we waited outside for the team. And people we didn't know were waiting with signs, you know, like, champions, champs, and, and, you know, congratulations. And I remember the cheers of the kids getting off the bus, who seemed like adults to me at the time. I mean, here's this, these heroes coming off the bus. Um, and it just kind of naturally turned into a welcome home party that repeated then the next year, and then it became traditions. But that first year was just, I mean, one foot in front of the other to see what would happen and and what happened felt as as an eight-year-old felt like magic. Legends are born out of sustained success. Under Chuck Kyle's leadership, the Wildcats created a legacy that is unparalleled among Division I high schools in Ohio. Of course, nothing is guaranteed in sports. And for all the Ignatius football teams under Chico's tutelage, their stories, regardless of the results, shared a common thread. They all had a belief in each other and a commitment to be the best they could be. Getting over the euphoria, that's okay. Take a, take a few weeks, okay? It was a long season, way longer than what we usually experienced. The kids had an unbelievable experience to of winning one, and I'm, uh, there's a desire to go again. There's a desire to get back at it. But in full realization, we weren't gonna sneak up on anybody anymore, right? Uh, people knew who we were. And uh, probably adding to the expectations and the maybe pressure, if you wanna say, uh, Dave Crowder from uh, USA Today called and uh, I mean, we talked about our, who's coming back and what, what's going on, and he called back a week later and said, well, you're going to be ranked number one in the nation going into the season. It, it's very easy for uh, coaches to go, ah, oh, I don't know if we're that good, you know, something like that. But it, if you're going to do that, if you're going to achieve that, you have to say yes, go ahead. For me, the biggest thing was that as we kept doing this, the expectations grew. And it was like one thing to win a state championship and maybe win a second one. But then all of a sudden it became expected that we were supposed to win this thing every year. And that's kind of a tough thing. And that's another thing that Chico had to address with us, that we had to just wipe that thought out of our heads and realize, look, we're just playing football here. So forget about the expectations and just play football. But that to me was one of the greatest things that I had to deal with personally, that these expectations were such that we were just going to go out there and win every game all the time. And it, what we were doing was really kind of amazing. But because of Chico's leadership, we were able to succeed. When I came to Ignatius, you, you learned on the first day that you had to pay the price if you wanted to win and if you wanted to be a part of this tradition. And that's something that I, that I always have carried with me, and that's something that I plan to, to coach uh, when I'm the head coach. So I think that association with success, but there's a reason why we were so successful. And obviously Coach Kyle was, was a huge reason, and, and really the rest of his staff, and he's always appreciated his staff. He's always given them a lot of freedom. But Coach Kyle, he's been the leader. I came in in the 90s, in 98, so we, we had one, uh, I guess seven championships and a, a runner-up and a couple state semifinals. So I, I just associated it with success. Well, you knew that there was an expectation of success when you decided to play football at St. Ignatius, but that's what you signed up for. 
When you're in grade school and you're watching St. Ignatius play in front of 25, 30,000 people in the playoffs, and you want to be a part of that. After lunch, second, third grade, you dream about being Scott Meech and you dream about being Dave Ragon. And so when you actually get the opportunity, it's just such a great feeling and you just want to take advantage of it. You know that with that comes expectations. Expectations that you're going to put in the work, do things the right way so that you can succeed. So that's certainly a part of it, living up to the expectations, but they're expectations that the community doesn't just have for you. They're expectations that you have for yourself. My son, Ben, who was the quarterback in, in 96, 7, and 8, he was interviewed and he was quoted as saying, you know, the state championship doesn't go through Maslin anymore, it goes through St. Ignatius. I understood that, that, you know, we're an inner city school, but we needed to become more like them. We needed to become more like Ignatius. And, and I'm not saying that we could be the equal of them in, in terms of analysis and discipline and, and level of execution, but I knew that if we became more like them, our fortunes against them would be better. Pre-game warm-ups, and, and at, at that time, you know, we were maybe a little bit like a lot of inner city schools where, you know, there's a lot of hype and a lot of, you know, all this noise going on, you know, wasted energy in pregame warm up. And at the other end of the field, you didn't even know that they were out there because they were quietly going about their business of getting ready to play great football. From the bus ride to on field and pregame, we took it as a business trip. Like we understood that we were in a position that if we were locked in and focused, that we would, we would take care of business the right way. And our coaching staff, so Chuck Kyle, obviously um, being the legend that he is, surrounded himself with unbelievable coaches. And those coaches held us accountable. And then the seniors held the juniors accountable. Juniors held the sophomores accountable. That was the culture that was created. We know we have to pick up the intensity on the offensive side of the ball. The defense has been doing a great job all year. And it's up to us to put the points on the board. And when we saw the upperclassmen doing that on a daily basis at every game, then the following year, the following game, those guys would do the same thing. And we, we continued that tradition of just staying laser focused, bus ride there, pregame warm up, locker room before the game, pregame speech, and then it was time to, to take care of work. I think a lot was learned, um, you know, first from those 88, 88 and 89. I mean, those, those guys, they, they had a belief before we knew what states felt like and looked like in football, and they had a belief and they made it happen. And, and it was one day at a time, you know, you put in the work. You do it the right way. You know, you show up to games, you're ready to play. You know, you show up to practices and prepare the right way. You know, so all of that kind of fed into, um, you know, a momentum that I think started and, you know, kind of kept and continued through the 90s to where it just became this, it kind of fed itself. That charisma, that potential, that attitude carried itself through the early part of the 90s. And, you know, I was fortunate and my brother and others were fortunate to be a part of that, kind of the front end of the, of the ride, if you will. I always loved, obviously, the Ed's Ignatius rivalry. That was always great. I mean, we had a lot of local ones here. Um, you know, fortunately, we played a lot of extra football in those days, so you know, we developed a few more. You know, seeing Xavier in, in the playoffs or Moeller, or, you know, so it was always great to see two big programs like that kind of clash. One that stands out probably the most is my sophomore year getting a chance to play at the Rubber Bowl against Maslin. That was pretty impressive and intense for a, you know, call, called a sophomore to kind of go, wow, this is what, what football's like only a, an hour south. And, and it, there was, you know, when you, when you go from a regular season game into the playoffs in Ohio, not many people around the country even realize that, you know, how many people we bring to a to a football game in, in the playoffs. And Ohio's pretty special, uh, not just Ignatius, but Ohio's pretty special for that. But I'll tell you what, those are, those are memories that, that, you know, you can't replace. Most people, when they think of him, will identify him with those championships. That's not how he identifies himself. I think, number one, he has a loyal spirituality. He's a family man. He's an educator. And that's what he's done as a coach. He's educated young men in a legendary way. There's no question. The impact he's had on young, men, uh, young men's lives, the impact he's had on the school, he has helped define what this school is for, for a long time. People look to him for his leadership. 
because uh, they know he's on, he's, he's guided by the Holy Spirit. There's no question about that. We'll always be able to talk about those championships. We'll always have them. And they're, they're important, but it's not the most important. And, and Coach has always believed in a great process, a process of hard work and great faith. That's what made those championships possible. Or even the seasons where we didn't win. We still had a great faith and a great work ethic. And that's what you carry with you. Because you don't walk into a job interview with a championship trophy. You, know, you have to have your values and your work ethic. You know, you have to be who you are. And that trophy is not who you are. And those trophies, that's not who coaches. Um, he earned those. The teams earned those. They worked hard. Uh, they were dedicated. Um, but that, to me, is that's only a small part of the legend. His commitment to his faith and to the school is really the legendary part, I think. I'd like to talk a little bit about the book that uh, Chuck and I put together back in 1997. Chuck came up to me and asked if uh, I could help him maybe find a publisher or use a publisher that I've used. He was interested in writing a book about his uh, coaching, his, uh, uh, specifically his ability to motivate uh, his uh, football players, his track players, more importantly, his students in the classroom. So in 1997, uh, we sat down and talked about this project. I should make it clear that Chuck Kyle is the one who wrote the book. My job was to edit and to find photographs, uh, to come up with the title, of the object of the game. And the first uh, quotes, Father Robert Welsh, who of course was the longtime president of St. Nature's High School. And this is what Father Welsh said in my forward when I asked him to come up with uh, something about Chuck. First of all, he is a teacher in the classroom before he is a coach. But in both the classroom and on the field, he remains a teacher. He exhibits great enthusiasm in both settings. He is also focused on complicated and honest, three qualities which usually ensure success. It is obvious to everyone that Chuck believes what he is saying and means what he believes. Family members, players, assistant coaches, students, parents, and colleagues have learned many lessons about life from Charles Kyle. Hank Gaughan, teacher and athletic trainer, states that Chuck has taught me to meet challenges head on and to celebrate the moment. Rory Hennessy, assistant principal at the time, and former assistant coach adds, Chuck has taught me not to be afraid of challenges. He has taught me not to be afraid of failure. It is better to try than to sit back and say, what if? The object of the game enthusiastically teaches the reader that young people can do great things. At the same time, the book renews our hope and faith in the human spirit by challenging us to believe in ourselves. Once I figured out that I wanted to coach, I mean, you know, in the, in the I don't have, I'm not a big saying guy, I'm not a big rah-rah guy, but, you know, the goal of the coach is to serve the player. So, that you know, that obviously stems from being men for others here, and, and that's what I think about Coach Cal. Like, he was, I think he took his leadership role of, of a head coach, and it was servant leadership, you know, and ultimately he wanted to do good for the team, but he wanted to see you, you know, ascend and be the best player that you could be. But he did that because of the attitude that he took towards you of serving you, helping you. You know what I mean? How am I going to help this guy? How am I going to help this guy? This guy's, you know, and you could be a backup. You could be the star player, Pat Massey. You could be, you know, a sophomore, Anthony Gonzalez, waiting his turn to come along and be a star player. And he touched each of us differently to get us to realize like, hey, this is what you need to do to become the best player you can be. Everything I do is based on what I've learned here. Everything that I do, I believe this. The, the game of football is quite simple. You know, it's not difficult to coach. Uh, it's not overly difficult to teach. Now there are some nuances and, and things of that nature. However, I'm a staunch believer that if you can build a better person, you can build a better football player. If you invest in people, the return will be, yes, they can play football more efficiently, more effectively. But if you go the inverse, 
You try to build a great football player and you overlook the processes, you un overlook the elements of the person that at the end of the day, that's ultimately going to be the glue that keeps them together. It's going to be the glue that not just keeps them together, together individually, but collectively within a unit. If you overlook those things, yeah, you may have a guy with great talent. You may have a guy with uh, a tremendous amount of expectations. But at the end of the day, that player and that person will never, ever fulfill the true potential that they have. And that's one of the things that I've carried with me again uh, with Coach Collins in a process in which he's managed this program. There's nothing that I do that I haven't learned here. There's nothing uh, as my role as a dad, and my role in business, my role in mentorship and leadership positions. There's nothing that I do that's effective that isn't rooted in the principles and the processes that Coach Kyle has given me. Wins, the championships, I, I just don't think that'll ever be done again. What he put together here um, about with football, I don't think ever gets done again. I just don't think you rip off that many wins, that many state championships, that many national championships in a state like Ohio, which is, you know, without a doubt, one of the top five states in the country for high school football at the division one level. It's just not gonna happen again. I mean, there, there was a moment in time, I think, where if you, you looked at a 30 year period, it was probably even shorter than that. But we had won like 11 state championships in, in a 25 to 30 year period. I mean, we were winning almost every three years. It, it, it was crazy, and I just think it's it's never going to happen again. Yeah, he's legendary. Just that's easy, right? I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. But I, I think it goes beyond that. He's the guy that no matter whether he was 14 and one, 15 and 0, and winning a state championship, or five and five and didn't make the playoffs. Hey, trust me, he'd rather have the success, and he'd rather have it for the kids than he would for himself. Every single role, from teacher to coach to husband to parent, I just, I always see him, is he always perfect? No, but he's always giving his best. He's always looking out for others. He's always trying to live that motto of this school and trying to be that person that you look up to and say, hey, you know what? That's what I want to be. That's what I want to do. I am not thinking back right now. I'll be an old, some, not yet, but uh, someday I'll be just some guy sitting in a rocking chair and then maybe I'll reminisce. I, I've never lived that way. I have, maybe to a fault, I, I've lived my life kind of with, like I have these blinders on and I go and I just keep going. And, and I, I don't have eyes in the back of my head, so I'm, someday I'll look back. I don't look back uh, right now. Uh, this is this season. To me, every season is like a new book. You're writing a new book with a def different characters. Is it going to be a comedy? Is it going to be a, a tragedy? What is it going to be? Well, we'll see. But you have to work your way through the book. And that's the exciting part of it. And that's what I've always been. So I'm not looking back right now. I've, I've got a, this season ahead of me. I, I really, truly, shudder when people say, well, oh, this will be the season, this will be a, you know, the, uh, just the born voyage party or whatever you want to call it. Uh, no, this is their season. This is these players' season. And nothing will get in the way of that. Nothing will get in the way of their season. That's how I've always coached and that's what I'm going to do. And so it's not this uh, farewell tour. Some people call it that. I do not want, I, that's not what I'm looking at. <laughs> I'm looking at, it's their season, and, and I want to make sure I coach the best I possibly can. Chico and I had a meeting scheduled with, with the administration, and the night before, Chico texted me. He said, hey, I'd like to meet with you tomorrow before our meeting, if that's okay. And I said, of course, you know, just name the time, and I'll be there. He said, okay, 7.30, your office. I said, okay. So he came in, sat down, and just gave the news that uh, said, I'm gonna be retiring, and I've asked the administration to, to offer you the position of head coach, and I hope that you accept it. And I said, I will. You know, I didn't have to think about it. It was important for me to hear from him. I said, Coach, if you're ready to, to hand this over to me, then I'm ready to accept it. 
And I need to hear that. You know, I, I, need, I need to hear that from you. Um, so he said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready and I'm, I'm at peace. I said, well then, if you're, if you're at peace, so am I. And, and I'm ready to, ready to take this over. And people ask, you know, how are you gonna be different than Coach Kyle? And, well, that's more based on our personality, but he's influenced me so much and influenced my thinking so much. It's hard to remember what are your original thoughts versus what, what are kind of his thoughts that you've adopted. Um, and they all kind of flow together and I'm good with that because he's been my coach and a mentor of mine and a colleague. Um, it's hard to keep it straight. So I, I think it's important to, to keep his values, those values that he's built the program on, uh, keep them alive in the program because we do believe in tradition. We, we value tradition here in, in a big way and we should. Um, we have a tradition that, that nobody else has and we love it and we embrace it and we should and we always should. The idea of, of retire, retiring from it is not easy. I'm, I'm still pretty vital. But the exciting thing for me is that this is being passed on to Ryan Franzinger and to Dave Sassetti and this whole coaching staff of, of young men that, that uh, love the school that get what we do in this program. Ryan is a lifer. He, he, I'm saying he's, just, he's uh, he certainly uh, understands the value of what the program is. He will win more than his share. He will have great success. He will make sure that young men uh, learn the work ethic that will affect the rest of their lives. That That's what Ryan will do. And we have uh, the other coaches that believe in that too. So I can leave with, with happiness in my heart because that's gonna happen.